Well, Michael, thank you very much for coming in today. Well, it's, um, it's a great pleasure for me to, to be here. Uh, I'm not a historian, obviously. I'm, uh, I'm a writer and I, and I write uh, a television series about, uh, about the Vikings, trying actually for the first time to show them not as savage barbarians, but as uh, deeply interesting, mm -hmm. um, quite complex uh, people and societies. And uh, I think this hood uh, will prove it. I think you're right. This, this range of material is going to show exactly what you are mm -hmm. trying to show, that there are all sorts of um, different cultural influences that are going on, yeah. especially in the Irish sea world, which is where a lot of this material uh, yeah. relates to in the 10th century AD. So there, there is four packages within this hoard, right. and there is a top layer that, that's one discrete package. And then underneath that were three things that were buried together. Yeah. So the top layer is silver arm rings and silver ingots. They're quite familiar to us from the late 9th century mm. and early 10th century, but they're normally found in Ireland. And so okay. this type of arm ring here, they're called Hiberno-Scandinavian arm rings. Uh, these have been flattened out. Uh, they have this sort of punched decoration on them, and there's a whole variety. Why do you think they were flattened out? Well, these ones, I think, are flattened out almost to turn them back into a bullion form. Right. Okay. And also, when they are more three-dimensional, they're harder to bundle together. So yeah. these were, 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 were bundled up, I think, in order to transport them. Under this natural gravel, um, deeper down, there are three more packages. One of them is twice as many arm rings and ingots as was yeah. in the top. Then there's a bundle of complete arm rings that are more like this sort of thing. Beautiful, Beautiful punch yeah. decoration on them. Yeah. Uh, those are complete and in the middle was a little wooden box and the little wooden box contained these three gold items. Yeah. So that's your second package. Yeah. And then there is a third package that's kind of the heart of the whole thing and it's one of these um, small about 10 centimeters high 10 centimeters wide a vessel with a lid on it in the vessel were um, these types of anglo-saxon disc brooches and this new type of anglo-saxon brooch here but also there was a anglo-saxon cross up at the top and there are even anglian runes that are carved onto these um, arm rings that we normally think of as yeah. an Irish style of arm ring. So there's little complicating factors yeah. whenever, we, um, whenever we look at this hoard. When we were laying these out for exhibition, one of the things that I began to notice was that there are these four distinctive folding patterns. One of the runic ones is flattened in that. One of the runic ones has a sort of three quarters fold, and there's yeah. a group there. This one has both of its ends folded over, and we have a group like that. And this runic inscription has just one end folded over, and all of those are like yeah. that. And this was quite, uh, this was quite mind blowing for me because people are always asking you are these collections the wealth of one yeah. really powerful individual? Yeah. And there, aren't, there isn't normally any way that you can tell. But in this instance, the runes, because they're signifying a person, they're, they're an identifier, yeah. they're telling us, I think, that there are four individuals involved, at least in this, this group of silver. The other thing about this hoard, though, is that it has more gold in it than any other hoard in yeah. Viking Age Britain and Ireland. This pin is particularly fine. It's exquisite, yeah. I think this, this is, is not worn by a warrior. I'm not quite sure yet how this is worn. One of the things that we'll have to look at is the type of fabric that that sort of poker-ended pin yeah, would be would, suitable for, yeah. what sort of garment it might have been in. You wouldn't want to lose it, would you? I mean... No, it's very, very fine and delicate. 
it's got niello decoration on it so this is a black silver sub uh, silver sulfide paste yeah. uh, that you use to inlay to enhance decoration but i'm not sure if you found this by itself i'm not sure what you would sort know, of uh, what culture age, it came from or no, what i mean we'll have to look a little bit wider than normal i think to to establish where this came from but because of the other things in the hoard like the silk in the yeah. the vessel that that are pushing our uh, sort of view out into the wider world. It, it justifies us looking a little bit further yeah. afield, I think, for where this was from. But in that Carolingian vessel, there were also types of Anglo-Saxon brooch that we've never seen before. So this is a type that's related to uh, the disc brooch, but it's this funny quatrefoil shape. Yeah. So a, a new shape but also it has these amazingly faces. evocative faces, <laughs> faces on them. With yeah. huge eyes. Big eyes, uh, yeah. So yeah. all the emphasis on that one is on the yeah. eyes. But if I show you this other one, this one's a little bit more delicate because it has the pin okay. intact underneath yeah. still. This one, the emphasis seems to be on the ears. Yes. The ears <laughs> are almost like a plug from yeah. the Beano. Yeah. Um, and the two other heads are blowing horns. Right. And so I think that this is <laughs> sound yeah, and yeah. their ears are ringing. Ring, yeah. And so between the two, it looks like we have a sort of evocation of sense, two of the yeah, senses, yeah. sight and sound. Yes. At the very bottom of the vessel is this, the most complex package. And it's three layers of textile in a pouch, almost like a jeweler's pouch. Yeah, yeah. So the, the outside is leather, then there's a fluffy middle layer that's probably some sort of linen, and then the innermost layer is silk, yeah. and it's wrapping what is probably a small carved rock crystal jar. Yeah. And as far as I can tell at the moment, in the 10th century, the centers for producing that type of carved rock crystal are in the Islamic world, potentially yeah. Cairo or Basra uh, yeah. are two centers of rock crystal production. Why did they bury these things in the, in the ground, do you think? Well, uh, the traditional interpretation is that it's burial for safety, you know, that right. they, and particularly the decoy, I think, would, would yeah. suggest that there is some sort of security yeah. So this. they might have been in flight or something after a battle or there? Possibly, although there was an excavation that was done after the hoard was discovered and there is a context for this. There is a building, it's associated with a building and there were features around that that had a burnt Watland daub. It seems to have been some sort yeah. of crook framed building yeah. and there is an enclosure um, around it. And so there is a site there, and there is, there is more that we'll be able to learn okay. uh, from that. So for me, in the museum, we begin from the objects and we'll try and reconstruct everything that we can about yeah. every individual object, yeah. and then we'll look at them in terms of groups, yeah. and then we'll try and relate the groups to the wider collection, yeah. and then we'll look at the context of the site, yeah. And then hopefully we'll have a range of researchers that are working scales of significance outwards. Yeah. Somebody looking hopefully yeah. at the political and ecclesiastical framework in Galloway in the beginning yeah. of the 10th century, and then perhaps yeah. ultimately even broader, because at some point we will try to integrate this material into the narrative yeah. that we have here, which is yeah. the Museum of Scotland. Yeah. So this is going to so in other words, I mean, finds like this are invaluable. Yeah, I mean, they, absolutely. It's, 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 it's part of a jigsaw that can explain, uh, as I say, but help to explain our own culture and, mm. our, and where we've come from and, and development. I think the, the preservation of the material is really important because in 20 years' time, people are still going to be looking at this material and there will be new scientific techniques yeah, that yeah. will have developed. I mean, we can do yeah. things now that we couldn't do 20 yeah. years ago and it'll be the same in 20 years' time. So the, the process, the conservation process that happens after is really important. 
and it's that it's that process that's going to bring out a lot of the fine grain detail yeah. and preserve and make some of it yeah really really mm. shine and yeah. make it stand out yeah. i just wanted to finally thank you very much uh, for coming to look at it i hope you yeah. you feel inspired by it like uh, i do uh, absolutely uh, absolutely and and it's an astonishing collection it's not just a, a, a wonderful historical find it's it's a his, in, within itself it's a, it's a fascinating and an extraordinary collection that i really would encourage people to come and see it for themselves